Now that World War III wasn't declared and the dust has settled over the Iranian drone and missile attacks, we can better assess what was the actual aim of Iran and what they could have done to be more effective in putting real pressure and helping the people of Palestine. No one wants to see any group of people face a genocide, whether Muslim, Jew, Christian or other. But at the same time, we are not pacifists, certainly not in the face of an ongoing slaughter in Gaza and continued occupation of Palestinian Muslim land. Furthermore, it's pretty clear that Iran hasn't acted directly against Israel while it was undertaking a genocide against the Palestinians of Gaza, yet they acted in retaliation to the reported attacks by Israel on an Iranian embassy in Syria, a point that Western leaders keep forgetting, thinking that Iran somehow initiated the attack and that it wasn't a response to the violation of their Iranian sovereignty. However, the point is that Iran acted only for their own national self-interest. It wasn't done as a response to the ongoing genocide. It wasn't a response to the massacres that have taken place against the innocent civilians of Gaza, nor a response to the manufactured famine Israel has also created for the people of Gaza. No, it was done because it served their Iranian national self-interest at that time. And once they had achieved their show of strength, they declared their operations against Israel over. So again, while Gaza is still being bombed and Rafa in particular is facing an imminent assault by the Zionist forces, Iran considers its actions finished. Even when Israel apparently sent some drones in response against Iran, then Iran attempted to downplay this claim, claiming that they were just spy drones or that they were shot down and that no real attack actually occurred by the IDF that required them a response. It's clear then that Iran never wanted to escalate the attacks. They never undertook effective measures that would have really put pressure on Israel. So what are the things that Iran could have done if they really wanted to put pressure on Israel? Firstly, they could have joined the successful naval blockade with the Yemeni Houthis. 20 to 30% of global supply of oil travels through this route. Furthermore, it's one of the routes that help supply Israel. Strengthening the naval blockade would send a powerful message to the West and to Israel to put pressure on them to stop their genocide. Iran could have used hypersonic missiles in conjunction with the drones and missiles it had launched. The drones and missiles launched from Iran took several hours to reach their target, up to nine hours in fact. The fact that these attacks were also forewarned. The Wall Street Journal had reported that Saudi, UAE and other countries were given forewarning of the attacks. This intelligence given to Saudi and UAE in particular was then passed on to Israel and America as would have been expected by Iran. And after the attack finished, Iran stated that it had completed its operation, now indicating that the intent was never to cause real damage, but it was for show, even if you want to call it a show of strength. They never used nor intended to use their very best weapons against Israel. They used weapons they knew would have been shot down. And again, that's after forewarning them of the time of the attacks. Iran could have used the slow moving drones and missiles to overwhelm the anti-missile defenses and then use hypersonic missiles to cause the real damage on Israeli air and land bases, military bases, destroying for instance Israelis coveted F-35 Adir fighter jets. Iran has the range of missiles and sufficient intelligence to target and cause substantial damage to Israeli military bases, but decided not to do that by the type of weaponry they used. So although the Ramon Air Base was targeted and seven missiles apparently landed, they only caused superficial damage as reported by the IDF. Allah knows best, but it's clearly apparent Iran was never really in the business of really targeting and disabling key military bases or key military infrastructure. Yes, we can say Iran's act were theatrical at best. They weren't sincere in actually really putting pressure upon Israel and stopping the genocide. But what we have seen with Jordan and its leadership is outright clear-cut treachery. The Jordanian King Abdullah had opened its airspace for Israeli and American and even British fighters to shoot down slow-moving Iranian missiles and drones. In fact, it was also reported that Jordanian fighter jets were also used in defense for Israel. For all the criticism of Iran's tame 
response, the Arab countries like Egypt have helped enforce the siege on Gaza, allowing Israel to effectively control the Rafah border. Remember, this is a border between Gaza and Egypt, yet Egypt allow Israel to control this border and what comes in and out of this border. Saudi and the UAE were all too happy to inform and provide intelligence to the Americans and Israelis about the incoming attack. And countries like Turkey still honor trade agreements with Israel. This is a level of treachery rarely seen before within the Muslim world. Something that's clearly exposed the current leadership in the Muslim world. This isn't about calling for khuruj or violent overthrowing of these regimes. But let's be clear, Muslim governments in the region are clearly more interested in defending Israel than doing anything for the occupied Muslims of Gaza and Palestine who are facing massacres on a scale unprecedented in modern times. Think about it. Without the intelligence given by the Saudis and the UAE of the timing of the attacks, without the stationing of American bases throughout the Muslim world and the Arab world, then Israel wouldn't be the protected entity as we see it today. It wouldn't be able to act without impunity against the people of Gaza and Palestine. That's why some have termed the Arab leaders as the real Israeli defense force. And one final point. Israel's occupation only exists because the Muslim world are not led by leaders who have an Islamic political vision for the region. By hosting American bases and American aircraft carriers in the region without using their military against Israel's occupation of Palestine and effectively shooting down missiles that are being targeted against Israel, all the while Israel with the support of America and the West are undertaking a plausible genocide against the Palestinians of Gaza, it's clear whose side these rulers are on. Now imagine the assets of the Muslim world that has over 2 billion Muslims around the world. Imagine placing an effective siege on Israel, cutting off the Suez Canal, stopping all shipping entering the Red Sea, closing the airspace to Israel, shutting off land routes that provide Israel with weapons, closing all American military bases in Muslim lands, kicking out American aircraft carriers currently docked in Muslim ports or patrolling Muslim controlled waterways. Israel would not have an effective defense for its occupation of Palestine and being used as a colonial tool by the West for its strategic interest in the region. You see, the Muslim world is not weak. It just has weak leadership that either openly supports Israel or like Iran, undertakes theatrical attacks. Even then, with Iran's attack, we saw how many Muslims rejoice. And by the way, this isn't about supporting Iran, not at all, but it's to show how desperate Muslims are to see a real strong leadership like that of Salahuddin al-Ayubi, rahimullah, a leader that would undertake real actions to liberate Palestine. We have the capacity to liberate the whole land, to provide real peace and justice for all, not just Muslims, but also Christians and Jews, as they once had before under Islamic rule.